Good morning, everyone. Can everyone take their seat, please? Thank you. Okay, this is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as items one and two on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local planning tri appeal tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 150 days of receipt of the application for zoning and, one, and 210 days for an official plan amendment. That's 30 extra days. The comment sheet is available at the door for anyone wishing to submit written comments on these amendments. So, um, welcome to uh, Agenda 61. Uh, declarations of interest? None? Confirmation of minutes from the meeting of March the 27th, 2018. Any changes? Are they carried? Carried. Okay, the first item up is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Community Design Plan Amendment for 3900 Cambrian Road, 3454, 3508 Greenbank Road, and 3345 Boris O'Kane Road. We don't have any, um, anyone here to speak on this. Does anyone have any questions? This is in my ward. No? Is this item carried? And now over to Council Vice Chair Tierney, who has a motion to. Uh... Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, be it for it resolved that Planning Committee request Council suspend the notice required under subsection 29.3 and 34.1 of the procedural bylaw to consider this report at the meeting of the 11th of April 2018. Be it further resolved that Planning Committee approved that this item proceed to Council for consideration on April 11th. Recommend, recommendation 2 of the staff report be amended to replace the date of April 25th, 2018 with April 11th, 2018. Anyone have any questions on why? I, I personally um, expected this to come to zoning to planning committee about last September, and because of some final work that we were doing on infrastructure master plan and on uh, the BBSS building better smarter suburbs, it got delayed. So let's make hay while we can. I didn't think there would be any opposition. So is that carried? Carried. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, item number two is the uh, in uh, Councillor um, Nussbaum's uh, Rita Rockcliffe Ward. It's in the old um, Rockcliffe Air Base, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment, 245 Squadron Crescent, 1400 Hemlock Road, and 775 Mickinac Road. Um, Jillian Normand. 
Does anyone have any questions on this item? Okay, so if no one has any questions, Jillian, do you still need to speak? Yeah. You'll accept yes as a, okay, so on the uh, item, is it carried? Thank you. Okay, the next item up is, um, it's uh, an exemption to a permanent signs on private property by lot, 4255 Strandhurst Drive, it's uh, a strip mall in um, my ward, and uh, I support this. Does anyone have any questions on it? No? Is it carried? Okay, thank you. The next one is also uh, an exemption to permanent signs on private property bylaw, 1795 San Laurent Boulevard in Councillor Couchet's uh, ward. Uh, we have, oh, Nathan Dart. Does anyone have any questions here uh, on the committee? So Nathan Dart, Pride Signs Limited. Nathan Dart, did you want to speak? Okay, well, there aren't any questions for you, so is this item carried? carried. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, and then the next one we're holding for a little presentation and also because we have one speaker, and that is the Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development Department 2017 Year-End Report and 2018 Work Program. I already said we have questions on it, and we have a speaker. Okay, and we're having a presentation because there's lots of good stuff that has been done and is coming up. Exemption to permanent signs on private property bylaw. This is, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Councillor uh, Fleury. This is in your ward um, and it is a very large mural, oversized mural at 215 Wartenburg Street. Does anyone have any questions? Did you want to say anything before we vote on it? So is this item carried? Thank you. Thanks for coming out. I personally think that this kind of life that it brings to communities, if done well, we could use a lot more of in this city. And then we have one which will be held for sure. It is the traffic signal for Terry Fox Drive at Huntsville Drive. It's in Councillor Wilkinson's uh, area. It is her item that she's bringing forward, so we'll be holding that because we do have some speakers, as I said. Then we have uh, information previously distributed, response to inquiry on short-term rentals. Uh, that comes from the uh, Councillor Dean's question on Airbnbs. Um, and so that's just before us. No one's wanting to lift that, I take it. Okay, that's received. So, hang on a second. So we have another item that we need to add to the agenda today, and Vice Chair Tierney has that. Great. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. That planning committee approved the addition of this item to the agenda for consideration by the committee at this meeting pursuant to Section 89.3 of the Procedural Bylaw. Amendments to Document 4 of Report, and it's included here within the, the statement. Okay. We've already carried this item, so we're... <coughs> no, it's, a, it's a new motion. To be it's a new motion? No, we don't. Okay, we'll just add it to the end of the thing. Is that carried to uh, amend that and to add it? Yeah, thank you. So we'll go back, uh, we only have a couple of items held, but I think they're gonna have a lot of discussion, possibly planning, infrastructure and economic development department, 2017 year end report and 2018 work program. Mr. Willis. And thank you for do, doing this on, on relatively quick notice, but you know, I was reading it again over the weekend and I thought there's a lot of work that's been done and uh, I figured some people might have questions, but I thought that it certainly warrants you telling a story of how busy your staff has been. Pardon? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
just before I begin, Mr. Reside's going to assist me with the presentation. And if technology works on our side, we'll actually be able to show you material that's actually on the city's website for the general public to get a bit more information than even we're presenting today. Um, I would also uh, acknowledge that Ms. Snedden and Mr. Smith are here to assist me in responding to questions in the respective service areas today as well. So I'm pleased to give this presentation to committee. It's, a, it's both a cast backwards in looking at what we accomplished in 2017 and a look forward at our 2018 work program. And um, just want to remind committee that back when the 2017 work program was set, committee actually approved a 2017 and a 2018 work program. And so what we're doing right now is finishing the commitments that were made in this term of council through finishing the work plan. So in a sense, you have already approved this work plan as a committee and we are working towards completion of that. And I know questions will come up today on the 2019 work plan, which we're not yet presenting to you and we're not yet at that stage. And in many ways, we must wait to the new council and the new planning committee that comes with the new council to get that approved. But certainly comments by uh, committee and we, are st and we will actually be seeking comments from the new planning advisory committee on what that work plan should be. So just put that in context context where uh, how we'll deal with questions like that. So this is a brief presentation. I want to go over the highlights. So if we can take the first slide. So uh, development activity and development applications activity has in, 20, in 2017 continued the upward trend that we're seeing. Uh, you've seen reported in a number of different ways. We've seen increases in the number of applications and we've seen increases also in the number of building permits that have been taken in the city. And that is generally a reflection of improved economic conditions uh, in the city and more development activity in general. The detailed staff report breaks those down both in terms of uh, the applications by type and also by geographic area and Ms. Snedden uh, and Mr. Asher here if there's any questions specifically related to those areas. Uh, just some by the numbers, some big numbers. So we had 173 site plan applications, 91 zoning bylaw amendment applications, 20 OPAs, 33 subdivision applications, five sub -condom plan of condominium applications, 21 heritage re reports, 103 heritage permits issued through delegated authority and 580 properties added to the heritage register. And that was the first tranche of the, of the new heritage register and adding the, new, the first properties to it. And we will be reporting back to committee uh, later this year and built heritage subcommittee on additional additions to the heritage register. In terms of the building permits and other forms of permits that the department issues, uh, 3,100 uh, non-building code related permit applications. Those are, there's a variety of pool enclosures and other sorts of permits that actually are, there's a fairly long list that's in the report of the non-building code permits that the building code department actually issues. Uh, in our right-of-way heritage and urban design group, we had almost 6,300 right-of-way permits and approvals. And the total value of building permits, and it's a bit of an indicator of economic activity again, is $2.7 billion of building permits issued last year. So significant policy projects in 2017 that we managed to accomplish. Uh, we're very proud of the work in our building better revitalized neighborhoods. We think that that is a very significant new piece for us to go back and look at, at existing neighborhoods and trying to look at a multidisciplinary approach to how we address planning issues involving other departments such as community social services, public works, and, and others as well. And this is complementary to our work on the Building Better, Smarter Suburbs initiative, which is again another ongoing initiative where we're trying to improve our infrastructure standards to reduce the utilization of land, reduce the costs of providing infrastructure in new communities and make those more affordable. Uh, in terms of a number of other projects we had. We had an update to the Riverside South Community Design Plan and we're going to be doing a further tweak to that in this year just to address the change to the Trillium line that was announced earlier this year. We did work on minimum parking requirements, uh, reduced minimum parking requirements in TOD areas. We did the Canada North Urban Expansion Study Area. We did award-winning work on the coach houses that actually won an award from the Canadian Institute of Planners. Uh, and we have been continuing to work through OMB related matters for the official plan amendments 150 and 180, and we also uh, completed the significant woodland policies. 
there are a number of projects that we as a department did that don't report through this committee, and I thought it was worth reminding this committee about those other initiatives. You would have seen them at council, but they are significant pieces of our work program from the last year. Uh, Ottawa 2.0, Ottawa Smart City Strategy, the Energy Evolution Phase 1, the Comprehensive Asset Management Plan update to council that our Infrastructure Services Group did, the transition of the Byward and Parkdale markets to a Municipal Services Corporation, and the Patio Bylaw updates. These are just the biggest files that we picked, but it, as you appreciate, we report through uh, a number of different committees uh, of council for the work of our department. In terms of our 2018 work plan, as I said before, we are completing what was the 2017-2018 work plan previously approved by committee, and we're focusing on completing the term of council priorities. Uh, this has been affected by some things that we probably didn't anticipate when we started the work plan back in 2017 and 18, and the biggest being the changes to the OMB to the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal and what that will do, and also the work that we've been doing uh, through uh, a number of different sources on inclusionary zoning. So those are important. And the other thing that wasn't contemplated in that but is a significant part of our workload is the R4 interim control bylaw related to bunkhouses and the study, and we'll be reporting back to Council shortly on uh, first phase of our work on that. Uh, we continue, will be continuing to dispose of matters before the new local planning appeals tribunal related to OPA 150 and 180, although, albeit, Mr. Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, they're under the old OMB regime, it's just rebranded. Uh, and we are doing work in anticipation of a review of the official plan in the next term of council. So we're getting ready, we're trying to figure out the methodology of that and the work that we're doing on the Ottawa Next program beyond 2036 is part of that as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. So in terms of our major policy projects that we're working on, we'll be reporting shortly on the Cleary New Orchard uh, Community Design Plan, TOD-oriented Community Design Plan. We have the Pinecrest Queensview one and the Gladstone Station on this year's work plan. I talked briefly about Ottawa Next Beyond 2036, which results from a motion of this committee to do some work in advance of the next official plan review to set the stage and review a number of matters of big drivers of change and some of the assumptions that go back as far as OPA 76. We have other community design plans in progress and trying to bring them to completion in terms of Mayor Bleu, the East Urban Community, and the Maraville North Community Design Plan, which is an offshoot of the Building Better Revitalized Neighborhoods Project, to remind committee. Our four phase one I talked about as well, and we also have the implementation related to the first two BBRN projects in Hetherington and Vanier South. We will be reporting uh, on our efforts on the urban tree conservation bylaw review, infill one and two monitoring, and energy evolution phase two. Some of those reports will go through other committees because of the mandates, but I, it's important that you understand those are big parts of our workload for this year. And as I said, we will be reporting on further additions to the Heritage Register. One of the things we're trying to do is within the department is to look at process reviews and efficiencies uh, within the system uh, to address concerns from stakeholders in a variety of areas. So we have five specific areas that we're working on in terms of process improvements this year. One is the adaptation to the new local planning at, uh, appeals tribunal system and working very closely with legal services. That will affect the way we give notices, how notices will work. It'll probably affect the way we report to committee in time. It's a little early to really understand all these changes, but we expect over the course of this year as we get further into this system, we'll be able to tell you a bit more about how this is going to play out. Um, we'll be briefing actually the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is coming to us very shortly to brief us on some of their expectations and that will assist us to brief you as well and provide you further updates, probably through uh, IPD reports just to give you updates on how we're procedurally moving through. We are working through the amendments to the site plan process and we'll bring them later in the year. We are doing an engineering process review, which is trying to find efficiencies in the way we actually review engineering on reports, which is twofold. One is finding uh, more efficiencies in the system of review and also trying to address some of the problems that we're seeing in, in, in basically trying to create space in the staff capacity to address some of the problems we're seeing in things like some of the engineering issues on infill, for just to give an example. Uh, we at uh, Councillor Leeper's direction and inquiry, we had, had raised some questions about our process on road cuts and restoration. We will be doing a review, a business process review of that area this year, and we are implementing phase one of our land management system, which is really a technological solution to replace very outdated technology we use right now 
on the building permit side and ultimately will go to other planning applications in time, which has benefits of basically having a software that's supported, helping us do our jobs, but it'll also make it easier to provide data to, to inquiries from the public because it's a, a, an updated system that will be easier to mine for data. It's one of the benefits of the system. So that is the highlights of our work program for this year. I'm just gonna ask Mr. Reside to, to take you to the website for a second so the public can see where they could get additional information that I've presented today. We're just going to fly through the slides very quickly. They're on the website. Can you do that? Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's on timer. Um, just go ahead. Just click it through. So this is an interactive uh, online um, presentation that has been put together by the uh, Business Support Services Group um, uh, for the pie, the pie to highlights for 2017. It is on our website. And it's just a scroll through. Uh, but it does give an interactive view of what services are offered by our, gr our, our new group and by and the highlights for each of those service areas. Some interactive pieces are these uh, heat maps that give us a view of um, activity in different areas of the city on development applications as well as a few highlights, and building code permits as well. So if you click on the areas, they give you how many permits were in that area at that time. And as we continue, it goes through each of the service areas. Infrastructure services is next. It gives a few highlights on the big projects there, including uh, the combined sewage storage tunnel, Ottawa Art Gallery, Rideau Canal Pedestrian Crossing, and our IDMP program, as well as our Comprehensive Asset Rich Management program. Next is Right of Way Heritage and Urban Design, a brief overview of what they do, as well as the highlights for this year, and a few of the projects. and our engineering services information database. And a small highlight on the heritage Inter in inventory pro project. Next we have economic development and long range planning. Again, a highlight on the services. As well as a few of the um, uh, management plans and policies that have been worked on. So we welcome councillors to, to use that as well. I think depending on your internet speed, this thing can scroll through faster, but uh, I think it gives you a, a good snapshot. It's sort, of a, it's sort of an online virtual annual report. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Willis. We do have questions and uh, we do have a speaker. So I think we'll go to the speaker first and then we'll start with Councillor Kluche who asked me before I even got up here to my seat. So, so far I have Cluche, Brockington, Hubley, Blay. Anybody else? Yeah. Not to disappoint. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, our, 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 is it our only speaker? Our only speaker, so our first speaker is Alex Cohen. Alex? <coughs> he's president, he's here as the president of Belltown Neighbors Association. And he's here on behalf of Whitehaven Community Association, Wood Park, so the community associations of Whitehaven, Wood Park, Lincoln Heights Parkway, Queensway Terrace North, Britannia Village, and Belltown Neighbors Association. And I'm sure that you do know. <laughs> I never can escape. I never can escape. That's I know. 
So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Yes, my name is Alex Cullen. I am the president of Belltown Neighbors Association in Ottawa's West End. And I am here representing six community associations that surround Lincoln Fields Shopping Centre and the Transitway Station. You heard them listed, Britannia Village, Lincoln Fields Parkway, Queensway Terrace North, Whitehaven, Wood Park, and my own community in Belltown. I'm here to ask you to amend the Planning and Infrastructure and Economic Development Department's 2018 work plan to add a planning and visioning exercise for the Lincoln Fields area to be led by city staff and involving the surrounding communities and stakeholders to set into place planning principles to guide the redevelopment of Lincoln Fields Shopping Centre and the surrounding properties consistent with the Council's transit-oriented development guidelines. On the screen, you'll see an aerial photograph of the area in question. Uh, I'm looking for a, let's see here. Ah, there it is, thank you. So, um, there we go. That's the shopping center. This is the transitway station, uh, very close by. The area that we're talking about is actually this triangle. And that shopping center, well, I'll continue with my presentation. Um, so, uh, you sh should have also have received copies of a letter dated March 20, uh, 2018, sent by my colleague Jonathan Morris of the Britannia Village on our behalf regarding our request for a city-led pla planning and visioning exercise for this area. I do have extra copies if case people don't have them, but I believe they were circulated. Am I correct they were circulated? Excellent, thank you. So, our communities became aware more than a year ago that the owners of Lincoln Field Shopping Centre, Rio Can, was proposing to tear down the shopping centre and redevelop it for residential uses, much in the same way as they did for Westgate Shopping Centre, which City Council approved last spring. We're also very aware of the coming of LRT to our community at, the Lincoln Field, at Lincoln Fields and the effect of city's transit-oriented development guidelines would have on our neighbourhoods. We also are aware that there are other redevelopment opportunities in the triangle bounded by the Transway, Carling Avenue and Richmond Road. We think there's a need for a coherent, integrated planning approach to this area involving urban form, density, mix of uses, pedestrian and cycling, connectivity to rapid transit, green space, main streets, parking, etc. We believe our requested planning and visioning exercise would lead to a better planning to support our community values, redevelopment opportunities in our area, and the city's policies. From this, then a more appropriate secondary plan can be developed to accommodate Rio Can's redevelopment, as was the case in Westgate and Elmville. On page 12 of your report, and if you can go to page 12 of your report, you will see a listing, uh, you, on page 12 you see the list of the department's 2017-2018 work plan. On page 13, the opposite side, you'll see light rail transit phase two station area plans for Cleary and New Orchard, the two stations just to the east of Lincoln Fields, plus Pinecrest Queensview, the station just to the west of Lincoln Fields, as well as for Gladstone Station. Would make sense to include a planning and visioning exercise for the Lincoln Fields area on this list, particularly as Cleary, New Orchard, and Pinecrest Queensview are line stations, whereas Lincoln Fields is to be a major hub station for the LRT. Therefore, our six community associations are asking that this committee add to the Planning Department's 2018 work plan, planning and visioning exercise for the Lincoln Fields area, to be led by the city, involving the surrounding communities and stakeholders, to set in place planning principles to guide the redevelopment of the Lincoln Fields Shopping Centre and surrounding properties. That's it. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex. Anyone have any, uh, Councillor Brockington? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cullen, for your uh, presentation. In essence, have you approached staff prior to today's meeting? Have you had a conversation? And if so, what has staff's reply been? Yep. So we, uh, Mr. Willis and I just had a conversation uh, just prior to this meeting starting up, but we actually met with planning staff uh, early in the, I think it was January, to uh, understand better the city's planning process. But uh, Mr. Willis can uh, tell you the results of our conversation. I was encouraged by our conversation, but let him give the good news. 
So Madam Chair, if, you're, if it's okay with you, I, I can respond to the Councillor uh, directly at this point. Uh, Mr. Cole and I would not put words in his mouth, I know better, uh, but I, I think we actually share some common interests and uh, what he has raised to us is that we need to look at what will ultimately be a development application for Lincoln Fields in the context of everything happening in the triangle between Carling, Richmond, and the Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway because in a sense that entire area is an area of change. And I think we will be, uh, like Elmville Acres, heading into a development application that creates a secondary planning exercise. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the Elmville Acres, and if we could replicate our success on Elmville Acres here, that's exactly what we would choose to do. And I think meeting with the community to understand their concerns and some of the precursors to that is, is doable within our work plan. But it'd be in the context of a secondary plan coming through the development application. But I think the issues they're raising uh, including looking just beyond the site and involving some of the adjacent landowners, I think are valid questions. So I think we can do this. And as I said, I'd be looking to model it on how we did on Bill Acres. And I think the point we're making is we don't want to be reactive to a planning application. The area is larger than just Lincoln Fields because you have the transitway station, the LRT station, uh, and you have the other properties. So we would like to be ahead of the curve as opposed to responding. And we think we have time because our understanding is Rio Can is not imminently about to present a planning application. So we think we can go through this exercise with all the stakeholders and the department and be able to uh, put into place the vision that we want to see. So Mr. Willis, did you say that you thought there would be an advantage in doing it in tandem with the, um, the, the redo of understanding what that looks like and then working on that together with the community associations, with the developer? Is that what, you, is that what I heard you say? Madam Chair, I think what I'm saying is, is that we would meet with the community to understand the issues that they would like to be raised. We would use those issues to help scope the work that the development application would be required to do in a secondary planning exercise. We'd probably encourage the owner Rio can to involve some of the adjacent landowners in their application because there may be some benefit to that. And then we can identify through the process whether, whether there should be some additional changes. As I said, it's much like the Elmville Acres process. Uh, it is led. I know the community ideally would like us to do it in advance. Uh, I, I think we're, we're not that far apart in terms of what we're asking. I think we can address the issues and understand their issues and take them into the process uh, quite legitimately. And we did learn from the, and you are the first speaker up, but we did learn from the Elmville Acres, for example, that uh, there was a real opportunity and understanding from both sides before it really moved forward. It definitely did evolve through that process, as opposed to you didn't do one before the other. You did it together, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you. Anyone have any other questions for Councillor, Co oh, sorry, former <laughs> Councillor? Oh my God. It's been a while. Oh, rest uh -huh. my weary soul. Don't say that again. I'll have nightmares for a week now. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Alex, for coming out today. <sighs> Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Willis, for the presentation, and thank you for your kind comments on, on Elmville Acres. It, it, um, it sure was a, um, a successful application, I believe, that, that ended up um, addressing a lot of the needs now and in the future, and uh, as we look forward to site plan coming for, for the first phase, it'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to engage with the community. And my question is, uh, Mr. Willis, uh, with on an important piece of um, planning infrastructure that's not explicit in, in the plan, and I recognize you may not be able to, to answer it, um, but I'd like an update on it. It's the overpass from the train yards development to the new Tremblay LRT station. Um, as you know, the Tremblay station in an Ottawa Citizen article was was uh, noted to be the least walkable and um, of, of all the LRT stations, and that's acknowledged. Uh, there are future developments going on at the train yards adjacent to the VIA station. Um, but the, the issue of a connection, which is part of the pedestrian and cycling plan of the City of Ottawa between Terminal Avenue and the LRT station, either a tunnel or an overpass, can you or one of your colleagues, Mr. Willis, assure me that there's 
progress on this uh, file and can you give me an indication of the work that's anticipated to be done this year in 2018? So Madam Chair, I'm going to give you a short answer and I'll, if you require additional clarification, Mr. Smith will jump in to provide that. Uh, this is a complex file in that not all approvals for this concept rest within the city. This is a, we're talking about Via Rail and over which the National Capital Commission actually has planning approval authority and Via has a number of requirements under the Canadian Transportation Act related to their facility security and other elements of how they actually operate. So what we anticipate in 2018 is meeting with those other stakeholders uh, via NCC, the owners of the train yards, uh, perhaps Transport Canada if they are required as part of this discussion to scope out what would actually be required so that we could frame that into a proposal for 2019 in terms of what that might mean in terms of preliminary design engineering type work. But we do need to meet with those other stakeholders to understand their requirements. So it's on our radar. We do need to bring the others into this um, and our colleagues in transportation services have to play a major role in this too because it is part of our pedestrian cycling network. So we, we do need to do that precursor work this year and I think by the time we bring the 2019 work program we'll have a better understanding of a path from here to there. Okay. Will there be, um, as you might know, there is a trigger in the current site plan for some offices along terminal to, to um, ensure, to, to um, obligate uh, Control X to, to participate in this, in this. Just want to bring to the department's attention a current site plan application for phase one of an 1800 unit development adjacent to the uh, central post office in, a, in an old um, truck terminal. Phase one will be two buildings, uh, over 400 units. Will the, will the department consider that as further, um, further support that this, that this uh, linkage, that is this important activity needs to go ahead sooner rather than later? Madam Chair, that's very much a consideration why we need to bring the stakeholders together the short term to understand what all the various approvals requirements, who's contributing what, where obligations exist between the parties, particularly Control X. So it's very much why we need to do this precursor work in the short term. Okay. And can you assure me that that work will be done here? We will have those stakeholder meetings this year and we'll scope out what this means for a future work program. I can't at this point commit to what that means because we have other budget and other considerations that on infrastructure spending, but I think we'll scope what it means, what, what a work plan would be, what the levels of design, who has approvals, who has to contribute what. We'll get answers on those this year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Councillor Brockington, followed by Councillor Hubley, Councillor Blake, and Councillor Lieber. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, we didn't, in your presentation, talk about targets that the department establishes and the report indicates that um, some targets are, um, staff are struggling to meet and I just wanted you to comment on how the department plans in 2018 to um, provide more timely service to uh, applicants. Uh, Madam Chair, there are a number of factors that, that impact those timelines. Uh, we are undertaking uh, process reviews, as uh, Mr. Willis outlined uh, earlier uh, this morning, and we're very excited uh, about uh, making some change. Just to give you an example, we've uh, started this year with new digital circulations of uh, packages as opposed to paper copies, and that's saving time. We just finished a pilot exercise with digital uh, approvals, and that has saved uh, five to eight working days, and approximately on one application, it was nearly $1,000 in, in their mylars. So we are looking at things currently right now, and we anticipate bringing forward a report later this year that will outline a full review uh, of how we're going to do um, uh, a better job at meeting timelines. I'm just pulling a, one sentence out of the report. It's just about the site uh, plan applications caused by a combination of issues. The increased development complexity and scale, extensive public consultation that's beyond what's required, internal complications such as workload and staff turnover. 
is the department sufficiently staffed to handle the number of applications? If the trend over the number of years is going up, uh, does staff have what they need to um, respond to these applications in time? Um, Madam Chair, uh, that's a really great question. We're undertaking a review this year uh, in terms of a capacity analysis. I can certainly state that um, in the past uh, few years, we've, we've really seen an increase. We're almost close to a 30% increase over the past two years, for example, in terms of applications, but we have not had any increases in staff. So, of course, at some point in time, we have to look at, is there a better and more efficient way that we can, we can operate? And, and that's what we're undertaking to look right now in terms of, is there, is there a better way to, to operate to ensure that before we come before and ask and request for any additional staff, that we've got the most efficient process going first. And that's what we're undertaking to do this year. But certainly, um, at the outset, uh, we, we will be doing a capacity analysis as well to ensure we have the appropriate number of staff for the volume. And when will that review be finished? Uh, that review we are undertaking likely will be finishing up at the end of this year, B Q1 2019. Okay. Mr. Willis, have you? Yeah, Madam Chair, if, may, if I may add, there's a couple of factors that are worthwhile pointing out. One is, is after the reorganization, we actually had a, a very high level of staff vacancy a year ago. Uh, we were as many as almost a third of the positions in Ms. Snedden's uh, group were actually vacant. We have been very aggressive in filling that. We think that will make significant progress on some of the issues. These are existing FTEs already approved that were vacant. We're addressing that. We also believe the engineering process review is going to be an area which will have dividends on overall processing times. So that project is also linked to this and extremely important. Thank you. Is the planning department similar to bylaw where a lot of the staffing costs are based on a cost recovery model? The Planning Act, Madam Chair, the Planning Act allows us to go for, for cost recovery, but the department doesn't at this point go for that. Uh, with the change we did in organizational structure last year, separating long-range planning, which is paid for purely by the tax dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a better results. We'll have, when, once we get the full year end, we'll have a better understanding of our overall fee recovery on development review. Building code for, certainly is required to be cost recovery. Planning uh, services, Ms. Snedden's group, is, will be in time progressively moving closer to the target of cost recovery. Good. Okay. My last question, Madam Chair, is regarding we sometimes hear accusations that the planning committee approves everything that comes before us. And um, I don't subscribe to that train of thought, but I, I think there is a public benefit to explaining the amount of work um, that the public doesn't see with respect to applications, how much time staff spends with applicants reviewing applications, that are tweaked, that are sometimes abandoned, that don't proceed, that are significantly changed before they see the light of day to this committee. And I'd love to see those stats because I think the public would have a better understanding of not just the volume, but how many applications are um, first presented to city staff and how different some of them become before they even get to this committee. Do we have those stats? presented stats which I assume made it through that were ultimately approved, whether it be site plan or subdivision plans or home amendments, but what about the applications that don't make it here where your staff spent a significant amount of time? I think that there'd be some value in understanding those numbers. Madam Chair, the Council makes a very valid point. I think I don't have, we don't have those stats readily available. We'll go back and look at this. I think one of the good indicators might be from the pre-consultation pilot project in the areas of the city where we do that, how many of those actually turn into applications because a lot of our work of dealing with the particularly difficult files happens at pre-consultation where they get a strong indication either from us or working with us and the community who sit in uh, that uh, an application needs a substantial rethink, and that's where a lot of that actually happens. I'll just add to close off. I'm spending a lot of time with my uh, planning file applications to the very beginning, being very intensive, deliberately, not just waiting till they apply, and we have one meeting and boom, we're here, but really being um, uh, immersed in the file and getting the CA reps on board and 
and having them be a lot more open-minded to tweaking the application, which won't financially hurt their application, but also reflect or respect some of those community needs. So um, again, that sort of parallels what I think city staff are doing already with those files, but I'd love to see the data if it exists. But anyway, very um, comprehensive plan for 2018, and um, there's a lot of good work going on here, so thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hubley, then Councillor Blay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of questions on the plan. Uh, following along what uh, the uh, Councillor uh, Brockman was just saying, uh, the figure three and figure four on page seven, which is the uh, site plan control manager delegated without public consultation, and you've al al um, already excluded incomplete or file pendings. So that tells me this is the work that we have the most control over, and you're only on target one third of the time. Is that, uh, to me, that's a very troubling number. Madam Chair, we're, we see that as a troubling num uh, number as well, and Ms. Snedden's doing a considerable amount of work to address that, and there are a number of issues. We talked about filling vacant staff positions. We really believe on site plan, particularly, engineering process review will yield improvement over numbers because as we try to understand on a case study basis where files are getting bogged down it's on the quality of the engineering submissions and the timeliness of the review of the engineering submissions and the number of resubmissions that are required and we genuinely believe that as if we hack that problem the overall numbers will improve significantly so that's where our, our focus is in addition we are going to be looking at some low risk uh, types of files where we might actually remove the requirement for site plan control to reduce low risk files from the system, which would give us additional energy to focus on the ones that are more complex. Uh, is a proposal we'll ultimately bring back to committee uh, in time, but we're still doing work on that. I look forward to seeing that proposal. The uh, other question I have for you uh, has to do with, um, well, you highlight it as one of your uh, five areas you're working on, which is the inspection uh, work. Uh, does that also include the inspection of the right-of-way um, work that's being done? Because I see on page 10 you've had uh, over 1,000 uh, circulation per year. And I know in my area, I, I've, we've got a great inspector, but I think there's a lot more work than uh, one for one person uh, because I see a lot of these uh, areas and, and we'll hear from residents about, you know, they come in to lay a cable or whatever, but they cut up a sidewalk and uh, just patched it and, uh, you know, it never, never gets reinstated to the way it's supposed to be or the way it was before. And where it becomes really bad is on uh, roads that we've just done a, an asphalt overlay on and somebody comes in and tries across the road and all of a sudden there's a speed bump in the middle of a road that, or worse yet a dip that uh, will knock your hu uh, hubcaps off until we get out there. Uh, I'm just wondering if you're, um, if you have a plan to in increase the uh, um, people doing the inspections or uh, uh, maybe perhaps what we should do is increase the consequences for um, the contractors that are not living up to the standards of the contracts and uh, perhaps that might be a better way to get better compliance. Madam Chair, the Council raises all good suggestions. They're all part of the business process review for road cuts right now. That is a project we've just kicked off. Um, we have plenty of evidence in front of us that we need to do a rethink of the way we do this, both in terms of what we charge, how we actually monitor it, how we inspect, whether or not there is a coordination of inspection between infrastructure services and right-of-way, and whether we can share some of the resources to a higher quality of inspections. So quality assurance is part of this as well, too. So it's absolutely part of the review. How fast will that part get done? It's a complicated file. We probably need uh, bylaw changes. So I wouldn't anticipate, it's going to take us the bulk of the year to, to come back, and I would believe it. it's something the new council will deal with. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Thank you. Councillor Blay. Thanks very much, Mr. Willis. Well, the last six months or so, I've been uh, becoming more and more concerned about the state of our building code inspection uh, department. <clears throat> Uh, the speed at which uh, building code inspections can take place and frankly how much is being missed uh, by the building inspectors and then needing to be followed up on by homeowners as they move into their new uh, their new homes obviously there are deficiencies in a new home uh, not all of which are building code issues but when I have a list of 30 building code issues 
um, that the inspectors miss, that's a problem. So I'm wondering what strategies are in place to one, address the staffing shortage I understand exists in the building code department, two, make sure that our inspectors are trained properly to understand the code and be able to identify these kinds of problems, and three, address post, uh, address the situation post realization of the problem to the homeowner's satisfaction. So Madam Chair, I'll give an initial answer, and Ms. Snedden or Mr. Ash can supplement my answer on this. Uh, as it relates to the staffing issues, this is one area where recruitment has been extraordinarily complicated in that in Ontario, we don't generate many people in programs who have the capabilities and skills to go into building code related work. So we in every municipality in Ontario are facing the same problem is we don't have enough of a pipeline of candidates on this. Mr. Bedin is working very closely with the educational institutions in the area. We're doing internships with Algonquin College in particular to try to create a pipeline of new candidates to come in and and uh, and frankly we, we have stiff competition from Toronto area municipalities to people with, with skills and competencies. That's, that, that's the underlying problem. On the issues of training and QA, we have had a high staff uh, change in the last year. New staff have come in. Mr. Ash, in particular, has been heavily involved in training new staff. And perhaps I could ask Mr. Ash to talk a little bit about quality assurance uh, side of this as well, because it is very much a training issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, we have a, as Mr. Willis had indicated, uh, we definitely have a, a resourcing issue right now. We have a number of vacancies within the department that we're working hard to, uh, to fill. Uh, there's been uh, half a dozen competitions over the last year to, to fill in uh, vacancies. We're still running at about a uh, 10 to 15% vacancy at any one time. Uh, it is a very progressive and, and uh, uh, training program that the building officials go through. Uh, it's a multi-year uh, program that ensures the quality of inspectors that we want to have here at the city. And it's a, it grows above the minimum requirements that are mandated by the province. Um, with regards to um, inspections uh, specifically, we right now the inspection uh, division is undergoing a process review. Uh, to clarify um, expectations. There was one done early on in amalgamation. It needs updating. It's, uh, it's happening right now and, and should be done uh, by the end of the year. And it will look to uh, streamline and uh, gain a greater consistency among interpretation uh, with inspectors. And Madam Chair, if I could just to add, uh, I actually was on tour uh, two months ago um, with uh, building uh, inspectors, and uh, it's uh, it's amazing the amount of times they actually go back and visit a particular house in in a, in, a, in the subdivision. Um, but certainly, uh, Councillor, if there's specific issues, we'd be happy to follow up offline. Well, I have a very specific issue, and I think the entire department probably knows about it. And th that's not the only reason I'm raising it, but that's primarily the reason I'm raising it. But it's one thing to have a specific issue with a, person, a specific homeowner at a specific address. When that issue is replicated uh, throughout the entirety of the subdivision, that's a problem, right? And when the homeowner feels that they have to include me on every single conversation they're having with staff because of lack of follow-up, that's a problem, and it needs to be dealt with. And if there are staffing shortages, if there are policy problems, if there's a pipeline problem, it shouldn't have to get to that point to get dealt with, is, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting at. I've been trying to deal with it without bringing it up a committee, and frankly this morning was the, the breaking point for me, and it just happened that you're having your presentation. So uh, for me it all lined up. Uh, for the homeowner, two years later, they're still dealing with building code violations that haven't been addressed. Thank you. Councillor... Leifer and Councillor Tierney. Anyone else want Councillor Kadri? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Leifer. 
Uh, first, I just uh, want to thank you very much for uh, taking a look this year at the road cut issue. Uh, I'm pleased to see how quickly uh, you've picked up that ball. Uh, the infill is resulting in trench after trench across our streets. I don't think we're collecting enough money to take into account the, um, the diminished lifespan of those roads as a result, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you bring forward moving um, uh, into the next term. Uh, and I also just wanted to make mention in the report, some of the residents uh, didn't see the Island Park Park Drive uh, zoning change to preserve those uh, setbacks. So I uh, just want to reassure people that that's moving ahead. Uh, my key question this morning, though, uh, and I know you're anticipating it, is uh, I've been chatting with planning for a couple of years now about Westboro. Um, we have a secondary plan for Westboro Richmond Road that is at least a decade old. Uh, it predates the arrival of light rail. Uh, the official plan has been updated a couple of times since that was put out. It's bookended on either side by the, uh, the new Scott Street secondary plan, which has been providing a significant and important up-to-date guidance in light of the most recent planning, thinking about how it's going to evolve. Clearly, New Orchard is coming along really well, and I have to congratulate the department on a, um, a very patient and, and thorough uh, job of consulting residents on that. Gladstone Station is coming up. The Wellington West secondary plan has been a defensible modern secondary plan, and then we have this hole in Westboro where residents are simply not, um, they simply don't feel that the, the secondary plan that's there is providing any kind of guidance. We know that it's out of sync now with the official plan and the new thinking around transit. Uh, surely it is time to revisit Westboro, which was one of the first secondary plans that was done under some of the new uh, directions from the province. Are we going to take a look at Westboro? Madam Chair, the council raises the questions of the change to LRT, the change to the OP through OPA 76 and OPA 150, and the change to the Planning Act as it relates to what it anticipates in transit priority areas. So I have asked staff to prepare some options to, uh, for us on an, how to tactically update that plan because it is out of sync. Okay. And uh, it's my anticipation that once we've reviewed those options and try to understand how we could do that in an effective way, we'll probably be working that into a 2019 work plan because I, I think it's self-evident that with the work we've been doing in, in uh, Wellington West and now Clary New Orchard, this is the missing piece of that continuous network. So I, I would anticipate we would have some proposal for that in 2019. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that because um, uh, obviously the intensification is happening uh, so quickly in that area where we have that gap. Would you take that as direction to prepare those options for the consideration uh, in, the, in the first year of the next term of council? Madam Chair, procedurally I think uh, we can take direction to develop options to present to planning committee on a tactical review and I believe we can do that. Ultimately, planning committee will have to agree with that and its work plan in the next term of council, but I certainly would welcome the direction because I think it is our intent. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Good. That was <clears throat> good that you took that opportunity. Um, Councilor Tierney, uh, Vice Chair Tierney, and then followed by uh, uh, Council. I'll see. Great. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the great work. Uh, a lot of great stuff happens here, and I think Jan said it before. We all understand that uh, planning is the heart of council. Um, it touches every aspect of every committee in some way or another, uh, and it really goes to the direction that the general manager, Steve Kanellakis, set out to say, let's stop working in silos, let's work together. So I really, it's a real quick question because I already have the inquiry in at council, and uh, I'm already seeing uh, how this can work in regards to uh, having all of our roads infrastructure available online. And I noticed uh, that in your presentation you had ArcGIS for the hotspots. Um, that's good news because obviously that is one of the, you know, the leading software packages that gives us the ability to be able to have all our streets online, know the life cycles, do all that great stuff. Are you guys actively working between planning and transportation and transit uh, to be able to look at this inquiry? And I'll let you respond to the inquiry in the appropriate way. 
Madam Chair, I, I wish Mr. Roger was here to help me. And Mr. Roger runs the GIS group in here, and we're actually quite proud of the uh, enormous amount of information that group processes in a year and supports every function of the city. Last year, they were heavily involved in the flood re response. They've been involved in supporting the clerk's office on a number of issues, transportation. And I think that group is in the process of responding to your inquiry. I do believe that the answer will be that it's doable. We just have to, uh, they're assessing what that would mean, and the information is certainly available. It's, it's about responding to some of the other aspects of your inquiry about how it could be made more available that we're working on right now. Great, and just as a quick follow-up, uh, I've looked at a lot of examples in Los Angeles, Sonoma, all over the place. They have them where you can go on any road, see the life cycle, when there's next resurfaces, do all that great stuff. Uh, if we do go in this direction, I've noticed they use, and forgive me if this is for transportation, we'll have to wait for the inquiry, uh, they use uh, PCI for uh, pavement condition index as a kind of a benchmark on your, con your, your condition of your asphalt roads. Do we use the same system here? I don't have Ms. McDonald here to help me answer this question. We do have a form of, of condition index that's based in the Comprehensive Asset Management Plan. We do rate roads by ca four, four different categories in terms of condition that, that is in the, the CAM report. And I think that's ultimately where we would draw the information from. As I says, it, it does exist. It's a question about making it graphically uh, representable. That's wonderful. I look forward to the re response to the inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Attorney, um, Councillor Kadri, followed by Councillor Nisbon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Willis, for the presentation this morning. And I do want to commend, uh, following uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Tierney's comments about the great work that the Planning Department has done and has continued to move forward with 2018, the rest of 2018 and 2019 in the future. Uh, just a couple of questions, uh, Mr. Willis. First of all, on page 14, you mentioned uh, for your 28, uh, 2018 plan going forward, uh, significant woodland and site alteration bylaws, those two items. How much more work needs to be done? Items are, are they relatively complete as it stands today? So Madam Chair, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, so at uh, Council tomorrow, you will see the results of the work that Planning Committee and ARAC have on site alteration. ARAC has asked some some concerns related to the agricultural community. I think we can uh, discuss this further at council tomorrow, but uh, they've asked us to do some additional work related to that, and we will be able to do quickly and bring the report back to the next council, we believe. So there's some bylaw adjustments that they have asked for for clarity, and also focusing the review related to certain issues in the bylaw to an area in the urban periphery. So uh, ARAC's uh, should council adopt ARAC's recommendation, will we should wrap that one up for certain this spring. That's easily done. Significant woodlands, we've done the policy work that we have had to do. It has been implemented. There's additional work that relates to urban forest management that's coming as part of the urban forest management plan and a number of other uh, issues to support that. So that's more in the implementation phase related to significant woodlands. And if there's anything more specific, you, the councillor has a question for Madam Chair, we'd be happy to kind of, I'll, I can get someone to get a more precise answer. Oh, thank you for that. That's, uh, I was just basically looking, looking for a general update on those two items uh, going forward. The other question I have in talking about uh, what you mentioned with uh, Councilor Leeper's uh, item about road cuts. I think road cuts are, you know, are very severe in terms of the city. Uh, I can give you examples so in my ward where a road was built two years ago and then, you know, uh, road cuts have happened in that road. Having said that, uh, there are other related issues to road cuts. Uh, besides the road cuts themselves. One is the utility vehicles, the heavy vehicles from hydro and other uh, companies that damage existing sidewalks. When they climb on sidewalks with their weighted uh, trucks down, does anybody look at that kind of uh, infrastructure and see before construction and after construction the condition of those infrastructure? Madam Chair, we're, ha we're having common discussion on really the issue of quality assurance as it relates to road cuts, and that's very much a part of our review. I think that's just another example of quality insurance and, and inspections requirements that have been raised uh, through some of the questions today, and that is something we need to address. Uh, so that's part of the business process review to look at this, and I'll take that specific point back to staff to make sure that it is actually included. 
And I just, I don't mean to single out hydro, I'm just saying utility companies overall do that work, uh, you know, in terms of the lines and stuff that are there, but they never seem to come back and finish it properly or complete it uh, properly to its original standard. So I just want to make sure that we're aware of those issues as a city and as a planning per department process to, you know, don't let those go by the wayside. Madam Chair, as I indicated, I'm not going to talk about any specific company at this stage. I think the question comes back about what we do in inspections and follow-up, and that's part of the business process review. So we'll take those comments specifically back to staff. Thank you very much, Ms. Rollis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, anyone else? Sorry, Sorry. Councillor Leifer. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I appreciate uh, getting back on the list here. One of the things that was raised was the Urban Tree Conservation Bylaw Review. Um, as you and I have chatted about a fair bit, um, the residents of Kitchissippi are particularly interested in that. We are losing our canopy to infill. Can I just seek that as we move through the bylaw review, that there will be a lens on uh, particularly the effects of infill and whether or not there are any changes that we can make to try to better preserve our tree canopy? Madam Chair, we are bringing further information back to uh, ECPC committee and on the urban forest well, conservation well, bylaw, well, urban tree well. conservation bylaw, as well as this committee. I think there's three things that are working in tandem right now. One is we've had devastating effects of invasive species. There have been some effects of infill development. That's certainly part of the equation. And there's also been some issues just in planes of coordination with utilities and other elements as well. So these are being looked at in the bylaw. Uh, I think what we'll find when we get there is we are looking at what powers does the city have under various under the Planning Act, under the Municipal Act to address this issue. I think our process will probably identify that we don't have sufficient powers in certain areas. I would expect that staff will recommend we seek additional powers from the province in certain areas, but certainly we're trying to address the issues in every corner we can because we do acknowledge that uh, the urban forest is an important part of our livability in the city, which is a basic objective of the official plan. That's, uh, that is encouraging. The, the basic understanding I have from the city is that uh, largely development trumps trees, uh, and if we, if we want to change that, that we'll need to seek provincial, um, uh, provincial changes. But the exact nature of what needs to change is something that's a matter of some debate and, uh, and discussion around the community. So I'm pleased to hear that we'll hone in on that and develop that foundational level of information um, first. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Nussbaum. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a uh, couple of very brief comments, and uh, I'd start by echoing um, the comments of my colleagues that uh, when you look at the list, there have been some great things done this term. Uh, Mr. Willis mentioned coach houses. I would add uh, the reduction of parking minimums was, I think, a very important uh, project in Phil 1 and 2. Uh, the pre-consultation pilot in the urban wards has been very productive uh, in my experience. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, Mr. Wilson, I spoke about infill one and two. We have, of course, the review of those um, coming back, and I know there's a couple of communities in my ward that are very keen um, on uh, becoming a part of that, so I'm meeting with Mr. Wise later this week to discuss that. Um, and then a very small parochial item, uh, only because it was both in the report and in the deck presentation. The BBRN project has been fantastic. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. Um, but you should know that the one in Vanier South also includes Overbrook, um, just for the record. Thank you. Okay. That's it. So, on the report, is it received? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so now we're going on to the next held item, or the only other held item, <coughs> which uh, Councillor Wilkinson, this is her report. We do have some speakers, and she has a, a short um, presentation to show so that you can identify clearly where she's talking about.
whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a very short show just to explain this a bit because there's some confusion. Uh, the list of the 19 that are waiting to get traffic signals, this is not related to that at all uh, because this is a development charge one that'll be 100% paid for by development charges and not by tax dollars. So it is sometimes a little bit confusing because of that. So some of the background of this, um, this was about ready to be installed over a year ago and uh, the underground plant's already in place, it's been put in already. Uh, and then the OMB ruling came down and they had to have all the, the, the intersections listed the DC bylaw. Uh, I was told it was in that bylaw when it went forward because this is a street one at Terry Fox, but there turned out to be two street ones at Terry Fox because it's a very long road and it was the other one that was in there and staff said, oh, that's okay, you can get it in 2019 and put it in after we do it in June 2019. But in the meantime, we have a real crisis of a danger situation. The developer is willing to pay the extra cost to build it now and get paid later. It's not going to cost taxpayers anything, nor is it going to interfere with the of the other ones that are in the list that the city has. So I think that's really important to know. Um, our staff have said they are, would in, are supporting of doing it now, provided the developer agrees to have it pay back a little later, which they have already done, and they can confirm that with you this morning. Because uh, the developer wants this, they're still building in that area. I'll show you in a minute that they, there's going to be 711 units when it's finished. There's probably over 400, maybe four, between 4 and 500 now. And it's adjacent to another development of about 300 units, so there's roughly 1,000 units has almost no access out, and I'll show you why that is. So this road becomes very critical. Um, that they will be paid through a fund ending agreement, so the city pays nothing up front. Uh, they, they expect to have, the, the, most of the rest of the subdivision built this year, about another 250 units, so you can just imagine how much worse it's going to get as the year goes on. And on top of that, we have one school already accessing into this, because uh, all schools have to be bused because there's no access any near the school, and there's another school opening in September, and we're going to have even more then. So this is just to give you a brief outline of where it is. You can't actually see the housing in this one, unfortunately, because it doesn't come out, it's very faint. Um, and this, see if this works now, most do. This doesn't still so faint, you can hardly see it there. If I put it on here, does it go? No. If you look um, near the upper part of that, there's actually a natural environment area that crosses directly along. So this development has no connection at all with the other developments. And the, uh, the next map may show that a little clearer. And the result of that is that there's only actual exits for these two subdivisions together. Two of them are on Terry Falk. One furthest to your left is the one we're talking about. It, it serves the large developments. It is a, a three-way stop because across the river from that's Terry Fox, the road along there, is the Carp River, so it can never be a full intersection at that point. It's also a rocky ridge, so there's a hill coming down, so traffic tends to be moving a bit. The one you see on Terry Fox towards the east is a right in and right out only. It's so close to the intersection that they put a median there so you cannot turn left. People come up and there is actually a traffic light. So unfortunately, this thing doesn't seem to want to show itself on here. Oh, there it is now. That's what I'm talking about. This is the one that's right turn right on it. Right about here is where the Richardson side rolls across, which ends at this point. And there's a traffic light there, but people from this one have to come and do a U-turn there because they cannot turn left. And there have been a number quite a few accidents because of that, because the right turners don't notice it. Uh, this is Canada Avenue, which is, it goes all the way up to the Queensway. It is actually has a traffic light. You can do a very convoluted run all subdivision, turning and sweeping around and going up like that to get there to get out. It's a long way around. Uh, many people do that anyway because it's safer. Um, the, uh, so that is what we, the situation is like there now. If you look at the area, this is the intersection again we talked about. You can see a little clearer where the side road comes up here. These are the schools. Terry Fox, between this, in this intersection here where the traffic light and all the way around 
to here has no entrances or exits onto it at all except the one we're talking about. Result of that, they are going, it's an 80 kilometer limit, it's a major material, they go 100, 120 through there. And that makes this, there's been a number of accidents already, but tons of near misses. And people say they take their life in their hands every day. It takes a long time at rush hour to get in and out. This is a school that already exists, it's an elementary uh, school. The children in this area go to that school if they're in the public board. This school under construction is opening in September. It's a separate school board. Again, this area will go to that school. I've confirmed both of that. The school buses, because this is part of the KNL lands that somebody heard about, they're not built in that area yet. So there's no housing next to the school at the moment. So all the children are bused. Um, this black line here is the existing Goulburn Forest Road, which goes across this area. It is closed for construction take a water main up to the new school and to start building the revised location of that road, which is to go this way. So that means that a lot of people used to come this way now have to come all the way around. And it's added, it made it even worse this summer, and that will be going right until the school opens, that will be closed. The um, result of that is that you have a very difficult situation. I just want to stress it's 100% development charge paid for, not tax paid. Uh, one that the developer is quite willing, and they will speak to that, that they, to, they will find any agreement now. Staff have indicated it will be after the next bylaw before they can get repaid. They've accepted that. Um, and so it's not to take advantage over any other one, whether it's a development charge one or, or not, to, to get priority. It's to make sure that we get it safely done in a way that doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. Thank you. So, is there any questions I might ask? But I think you might ask them for developers. I think. Questions for Councillor Wilkinson? <coughs> yeah. Uh, Colin, Colin Simpson is here. Uh, I in charge. And, and, Phil, and, and Phil Andrews, Andrews here. Gary Adams. Baker's here. And the councillor's here. That's it? I'll ask my question. Thank you. Okay, okay ask the question. Um, go ahead, Councillor Blake. <clears throat> so, uh, by adding this to the development charge or approving the front ending agreement early before the development charge bylaw review is completed, presumably the developer, okay. presumably the developer wants to get paid back uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Or that, that's typically my understanding of how their business practice is. Um, by approving it today before amending the bylaw and seeing the projects that will be included in the bylaw, and the prioritization of those projects, are we basically putting this project as a higher priority before the full review is done? And I say that because obviously the builder is going to want their money back within a reasonable amount of time. Madam Chair, the simple answer to that question is yes. Yes, can you? So we are, we, before we do a review of all intersections and all projects, and I'm sure there are lots within the growing parts of the city that need modifications and or as they build out will need controls in, in the first place, what is the logic in predetermining priority prior to the wholesome analysis being completed? Well, it's fortunate you've recently seen the list as well. Well, that list, I understand it. I'm not sure if that was DC projects or if that was tax that was actually the why gap in tax supported projects. That's right, and that's why the councillor wanted to do this demonstration 100%. to show you. Yeah, so, who's going to uh, take that question on? Madam Chair, there's a, a list of approximately 70 intersections in the DC bylaw. So one location um, that is not currently in the bylaw. And uh, we uh, regularly review the warrant analysis for all of those intersections. And uh, reviewing where we are with those intersections, we see an opportunity for payback in 2022. And when we review, uh, you know, do a more fulsome analysis as part of the 2019 update, we'll be reviewing and prioritizing all of that long list of intersections. But currently, right now, with the list of intersections that we're looking at, you know, the budget authority that we have and the warrant analysis that we have, you know, our program is full up until 2021, and we see an opportunity here for payback in 2022. So although the, the developer 
willing to build the intersection as a front-ending agreement and it can go in much earlier, they wouldn't get paid back until 2022. No, I, I appreciate that and thank you for that clarification. I guess my point is we already have a list of projects we would want to pay for in 2022. And as a result, how does adding this before the Folsom review is done affect either the timing or the financing of those 2022 projects? You know, we can foresee uh, a, an intersection at 10th line in such and such that might come online or, or need to or get warranted in 2022. And as a result of this project, others, if people decide to leapfrog after this point, that changes our capacity to, to, to repay. You know, we could ask uh, one of the developers in Area 10 to the next 10th line traffic light tomorrow, and I'm sure they'd say yes, and I'm sure it's in the D.C. bylaw for some time in the mid-2020s, and, the, and then all of a sudden we're throwing the whole schedule out of whack before we've looked at the system uh, in its entirety, and before we've changed the charge to collect more money. So I guess my question is, what's the logic in that? I, I'm look, I presume staff support, staff support this, and if they do, I'd like to understand why yeah, Madam in the Chair, context the, of that logic. Madam Chair, the staff support this uh, recommendation because we've reviewed the warrant analysis for all of the 70 intersections. This location is near warranted at 97%. We expect it'll soon hit those warrants. Um, there's only four or five intersections that are currently at warrants on that list of 70 intersections. So um, we're comfortable with positioning it for 2022 because it's not bumping in terms of the MTO warrant analysis. You know, it's there isn't any other intersections on that list of 70 intersections that it is slotting being slotting slotted ahead. There's intersections on Brian Comber Boulevard that we're currently working on, and and all of those are near. Are, are near the 100%, if not warranted today, and we're not bumping any of those. We're moving forward with the program, and where we're slotting this program in at 2022, we believe is ahead of all the other warrant. It's more warranted than any of the other pr intersections on that list from our perspective at this point, and we're gonna review that more closely as part of the 2019 update as well. So by uh, supporting this motion today, are we formalizing we're not formalizing the details of the front ending agreement, are we? we? We are asking staff to begin negotiations on a front ending agreement, and the front ending agreement will have to come back to this committee for approval, and that front ending agreement will have the payback period on it. Madam Chair, the Councillor is correct. And when would you anticipate that that report would come to committee? Madam Chair, I'm advised that we expect July as a timeline. Okay. I was hoping you were gonna say later that the study at least would have already started. Will, will the, the working group or the, uh, the sponsors group or whatever the title is for the DC bylaw have at least met and understood the pressures that we anticipate to be added to that bylaw prior to the front ending agreement coming to committee. Madam Chair, most certainly we will have. We expect that first meeting to occur within the next couple of weeks. Okay. I am happy to support staff to begin working on this. I'm not at all convinced that we should be adding projects to a priority list before a holistic review of what those priorities need to be has started and is any close to being done. If the developer wants to do it with an open-ended payback period in the mid-2020s, it's one thing. If all of a sudden we're gonna be changing how we prioritize projects in growth areas, I think that's a problem. Really good point to raise. I wanna ask Gary to uh, chime, chime in on the um, you are really the person that's most respected for development. I know you hate it when I say that to you, but it's true for development charges, and you've had some pretty firm opinions on this. So I'd just like you to speak to that. Uh, through the chair, and uh, I don't, um, I'm in the agreement with what Councillor Blay has mentioned. I would prefer to look at it more holistically. And uh, in 2019, we did a holistic review. We cash flow the charge 
to take into account the timing. And uh, I would prefer, if it was my, to wait until the 2019 update and uh, to reprioritize. And uh, if we cash flow the charge again and we want to account, if there's certain intersections that have to be advanced, then we would development charges up front to pay for those intersections and to do it in that uh, methodology. We are about to uh, hire a consultant next week to uh, start up on the 2019 BC bylaw update and uh, and we could look at what we've done back in uh, 2017 but that would be my uh, inclination is to wait and for a more comprehensive review and look at all the priorities throughout the city but if I mean I, I don't want staff th th they also have expertise I'm just saying from my financial background or financial inclination on this issue I prefer to wait can I just ask a financial question? I know we don't have really financial people here, but currently, how many paybacks of, of front-ending money do we have for front-ending agreements for 2022? Do you have any idea? And then my question, because what I want you to think about, so think about this before, uh, you know, if it passes before council for sure, but how, what would the pressure be uh, on the city treasurer in saying, you know, with the long range financial plan, which we just approved, updated, what does that mean to that, to the ones that are already in, green, in the queue? Uh, last year, we, we had um, another one that uh, we had to put in, if you remember, for Leitrim and uh, Finley Creek area on Bank Street. And I know that the uh, city treasurer was adamant that the payback couldn't be till 2026 or something, but we ended up working out a deal to come, I think it was 2022. And I think we need to have that kind of consideration. But one thing that sounds conflicting is the difference between what Mr. Simpson said, uh, Mr. Willis is saying, and Gary, you're just consistent in what you're saying about how development charges are, are gathered. So they are different. The, the, the list that we got with regard to Meandering Way, which shows Meandering Way 75th at least, at, at, at highest, um, and the ones is not the same list that's funded that we're talking about today. So that's, keep that in mind as well. I think Councillor Kubley is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, uh, you know, congratulations to uh, Councillor Wilkins on that she was able to uh, um, work out an agreement with the uh, developer for the area to do the front ending because that's not always possible. but. Uh, it highlights a problem here, and uh, we're seeing one in, in the Stittsville, Canada area as well, where uh, it's created a very, very unsafe situation because of the delay to get the singles in. And uh, I think as a direction to staff, what, if the committee supports it, what I'd like to see is uh, staff look at how this happened in the first place. How did this get missed in the DC bylaw? Why was it not... Uh, on the list for coming in there since uh, the planners already were approving these houses. And to, to provide some context, Councillor Wilkinson's talking about a couple hundred homes in that area and hundreds more being built. In Councillor Cadre's area, it's in the thousands of homes that have been built and existing and we're still waiting for the light. I have a picture I can share with the committee of a cement truck coming across wh where the median should be, coming right at, head on at traffic uh, to make an illegal left-hand turn to get in a road that shouldn't even be open because the light isn't there yet. We have an OC transfer bus going down that road. It's been approved to go down that road even though the roads are not in place or any of the safety measures. So I've got real issues with this. I think we're going to have tragedy on our hands if we keep allowing this to happen because if you see this picture and it was taken by a senior citizen in the passenger seat of a car and they just about had a heart attack with this uh, truck coming right from them. and this happens every day at that location so I'd like to see staff go in take a look at what's going on here and start putting some safety measures in place if they cannot get the lights up we should be barricading these roads or doing something to prevent uh, 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 somebody getting hurt here because the public trusts us to do that. And I, in, this, in the case I'm thinking of in uh, Castle Cadre's area, we've let the public down. 
So uh, can we give that as direction that they take a look at what happened here and what can we do to put some measures in place until we get this uh, uh, situation with uh, lights and other traffic measures uh, looked at? Well, I think there's a time and a place for that. <coughs> and I think that... Uh, Preferably that before somebody gets in the chair. But, that, but that's, I mean, we could all talk about a high-risk situation. Yeah, in they're the, all over the in city. Our, well, and, and more so in the suburbs because mm -hmm. they are not funded through taxpayers' dollars. So right. the changes that happen downtown consistently never get out of line of the time that they are developed. Elkins on track, O'Connor was done, Queen Street's now closed, et cetera, et cetera. There's never a heartbeat because every taxpayer in the city pays for that. Every single one. And so the pot that's going to pay for the meandering way, which is more than 75 from that list, is a pot that's, you know, the taxpayer is all happy to pay for. This is entirely different. And I just will remind you that Airport Parkway has been pushed off two years at least now. I had to steal $80 million from the Green Bank realignment, which included a, two, two bridges over the Jock River for where the greatest growth in the city was in order to pay for strand hurt. Okay, so am I going to say, hey, let's get all on board and understand intersections? I think it's a bigger discussion we have to have, and I think that it's one that's appropriate, uh, certainly on the development charges through us, but definitely at the Transportation Committee. I think that that's a discussion that we have with that councillor. Okay. Um, but I think that this is the second meeting in a row where the same topic continues to be the most important issue. It's about safety, right? It's about, uh, and we know, and well, you don't maybe know, but the, um, as you know, we're in the smart situation and the <coughs> we had a phenomenal number of people that participated and overwhelmingly they're not one issue is transportation and safety and that sort of thing in our city uh, to be smart city looked at. So I, uh, let's have a discussion about that after we get through the speakers and uh, we do have more counselors to ask questions but you bring up, a, a, you know, a, a, sorry, a very valid uh, points so far both of you have for sure and Councillor Wilkinson is in this predicament, right? And, and it's exacerbated by certain things like the Goulburn Forest Road being closed, right? I mean, maybe part of the solution is let's get her open. <laughs> um, but we don't know that yet. So I go to the other speakers and then we'll come back and have the speakers that have come here, the delegation that has come here today, um, and then maybe some more discussion, okay? All right, uh, Councillor Brockington and Councillor Tierney. Anyone else want to? Uh... Okay, so. But that's okay, then we're still going to uh, this Nisbaum, go ahead, uh, Councillor Brockington. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just for me, colleagues, this issue is about safety. That's, that's the issue. And we can arm wrestle about the impact of the Treasury there. And I think it's very valid to make sure that um, we understand in, in the grand scheme of things about whether other priority projects are going to be displaced or not. The, the, the focus for me is we have an intersection that's at 97% warrants. There's more development coming and we've got schools, uh, at least one school opening up this fall. And so <clears throat> the issue really is how to improve safety in that neighborhood. And if this were to be rejected, what will staff do to improve the safety of this intersection if traffic lights don't go in? That's something we haven't heard of. But I just wanna make sure I, I understand two of the main issues. One, staff have said this will not displace other priority projects from the list. I think I heard that correctly. And the other issue that I think I need more, a better understanding on is how this impacts um, the treasury or, or the payback period. If the developer is, is willing um, to be paid back or wants to be paid back sooner rather than later after the treasurer's been working out agreements, is that the issue is the amount of money the city has to pay back that gets negotiated through the contract? Is that one of the main concerns you have is that the developer's expectations is that be sooner rather than when perhaps the city treasurer would prefer to pay back this investment? Well, I think it, payback's always uh, subject to discussion and uh, review. I think initially we were looking at a payback in 2025, but I guess staff reviewed the situation and said it was 
uh, possible to pay back in 2022. Um, the, I guess the, the account that the funds are being allocated from is in a deficit. We are trying to recover that deficit currently uh, when we updated the 2016 study. And uh, so if, if this is a priority of, of council or committee to go ahead and, and fund it, it is 100% it is DC and uh, the uh, funds would be allocated out of that particular reserve fund to pay for the works. So if, if this is approved today, that payback period is something that is to be negotiated, correct? We're, we're giving sort of the high level approval, we're being asked to, but those parameters between the city's challenges and the developer's expectations get hammered out. Okay, so. So. I'm, will, I'm willing to support this. You what? I'm willing to support the recommendation okay, so before I'm just, us. So I'm just gonna read the recommendation because yeah. I haven't said it out loud because it's different than what the rest of you are talking. And I talk back to Councillor Blay, you were talking about you want the DC sponsor group to come together and have information and this report would come back. But the, what this motion says is the planning committee recommend council approve. One, approve that the city staff be directed to bring forward an amendment to the development charges background study at the earliest possible date to include a traffic signal for the intersection of Terry Fox Drive and Huntsville. And number two, that the report address the necessary steps to approve a front ending agreement as soon as possible so the signals can be installed this year before school starts in September. Okay? I, I just want to on the floor because I think that we're talking, some people are talking future, some people are talking, okay. Look. Clarification then? Yeah, clarification. Staff think it should go in the DC bylaw study, or bylaw, um, they've indicated that I have no doubt that in 2019 it'll go in. I have no problem with saying just put it in now. That's fine. No problem with the work happening now to improve the safety situation. That's fine. My concern is that the approval, the, the refund of the money to the developer needs to happen at a date that is appropriate within the context of our complete understanding of the system. Um, and just so that the community should be clear that perhaps the developer may not want to be paid back in 2025 and 2026 and having spent a quarter million dollars and not getting paid back for you know almost a decade right my experience they want to pay back on some of these things not a seven to ten year payback and so I want to understand how the it affects everything else that we want and as we've heard we can't currently afford all the things on and so that becomes a big problem. That's why I read it, and that's why I asked for that financial, which you don't really have here. So count, hang on a second. Um, it's Councillor Tierney next. Um, Councillor Tier Tierney, hang on, Marianne, I'm going to write you down. Hey, oh, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Tierney. <laughs> Whatever, I've been called worse. I'm getting um, scatterbrained. First, uh, thank you. and. The chair. We almost need a joint uh, transportation and planning committee. We are talking so much about roads these days. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think you've heard a lot about my concerns in my area, and it, it seems like a two-tier system. So I'll I'll leave it at that. It truly is. We got our DC, we got our city funded, and uh, a lot of our colleagues around the table wish we had access to DC funds to be able to expedite things for sure. But it's a two-tier system that's governed by one set of rules is my understanding. So when you talk about 97%, it's close to the warrant level, similar to the intersections I've highlighted several times, it's 95 to 96%. Are you telling me staff have authority to wave a wand and say, well, it's close enough, we're almost there because I've been doing this dance for four years, not hitting the 100% mark, and I, I need an explanation why it seems to be different for DCs versus it is uh, if it was a city funded stoplight. Uh, Madam Chair, there's certain uh, 
rules and policies associated with the development charge bylaw that for payback of DC funded uh, infrastructure that the funds uh, would be fully warranted and that they would uh, not be used for temporary measures. So in this case with the payback in 2022, we're confident that those two policy pieces would be um, achieved. That's what would be achieved at that point and the work that we're doing here is obviously going to be in the ultimate state. And of course, again, uh, safety is, is I think it's great, but I don't think you've answered my question. Are, are we here because it's not hitting the 100% mark? It's at 97%? No, we're here, Madam Chair, we're here today because this intersection is not in the DC bylaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's before you today is to put direction towards staff to put it into the DC bylaw so that a front ending agreement is possible. Not right. having a DC, DC bylaw means it's not front endable. Right, and, and this is kind of my point. It's, it's two tier, it's a little different. And you mentioned the 97%, it's close. So do you just forget about it being 100%? We're confident that it'll be 100% before the payback period in 2022. With the other program that Traffic Services manages, those are intersections that are in existing built up developed areas. And so it's managed differently, it uses tax dollars and we go through our infrastructure department to build those that infrastructure and we secure the the budget authority before that uh, proceeds with the development charge projects on this list um, um, there's several different ways of implementing it and it's through a front ending agreement but the warrants still need to be hundred percent satisfied before the funds are reimbursed so they do have to so they'll have to so they do another they do have study. to conform to the same policies but in the same policy direction but we're confident that by 2022 ish you know, these warrants will likely be later this year or next year. And what if it's not? And what if it's not, what if it doesn't meet the warrants? Because you've just said it has to meet the warrants, similar to what I have to do on a city funded perspective. What if it doesn't? What if it's 99.5%? Then the applicant would continue to pay the annual operation and maintenance costs, which would be a roughly $10,000, and payback would occur until the warrants are fully, uh, fully met. And is there any other DC related that are over 97% on the warrant level at this point that could possibly be candidates? And I'm only asking just to assume we're not queue jumping here. There are approximately five intersections on the list of, of the DC list of which there are already uh, under construction or will be in construction in the next year or two. So would they, would they have the same opportunities? to be able to come with their developers and, and make changes like this too, since they're so close. And I assume they're gonna be over the 100% mark as well. On the DC list and um, they are at or near 100% and the, our processes are in work to uh, that work over to our infrastructure services department to implement that infrastructure in these locations and the funding is reserved for those locations. Okay, great. And uh, just final final question, I think it's just more frustration from, you know, established communities where in other words are seeing a lot more traffic and we have to go through the day dance. Um, when, when we go to do and start implementing new intersection changes, two separate teams? Is there like a DC team that gets there, there and builds one and then a city funded one? Or how does this work? Because I'm afraid of resourcing if we start saying, yeah, let's start building like crazy, but we'll do the DCs first because, you know, we've got the money there. It's a low hanging fruit. Is that going to go away from our ability if we have the money? Let's say we make it a big budget discussion next year and we have the money. Are we going to be able to do all these intersection modifications or do we need more resources? Madam Chair, typically the construction is undertaken through a private contractor, so the, it's a, if it's a, a developer-built uh, intersection, they would tender the, pro, the, uh, the work and a private developer would do that work and there would be city resources to uh, do the inspection for final inspection before the release of the, the security. And, and I'm asking this specifically because I've had developer funded intersection modifications. I have a shopping plaza and I know how then I felt they were stretched and there were some challenges with that intersection in a major way. So I just want to make sure we're not, you know, short shooting ourselves on the and, uh, and not having the appropriate number of people. So just all food for thought if we're going to start saying, yeah, let's go ahead and start rushing stuff through. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Tierney, to uh, Councillor Nussbaum and then Councillor Wilkinson. Anyone else before I go to delegations? Questions of staff? You're good? Okay, Councillor Wilkinson, and then we'll go to our yes. first speaker. I just want to make this very clear. This shouldn't have to have been here at all. 
Somebody along the line made a mistake. This was supposed to be in that list already in the DC. Somebody missed it. I don't know why. It was already a development that was approved. It had in its, in its approval that you had to have this traffic light, and that was done before the bylaw was even written that put in the 40. And I, I was told it was in because there was a street one on Terry Fox, but there were two. And so some, I'm not going to make blame who did it. It happened. I'm just saying because it should be there already, to say you can't do it doesn't make, make any sense at all when the need is very, very acute. This is a high, high speed road. It's not, uh, it's even, it doesn't, you can't put it up here as you have some of the other ones waiting for them on the list have three way or four way stops that has a little bit of control. It's not enough because when traffic gets high, those don't work very well. I have nothing. And the people there are scared to death. You've seen some of the emails that have come through. And the, uh, and, the, and there's children involved. There's, there's OC transport buses turning left at that case. There's all sorts of things happening already. And plus the construction that's still going on means you've got a lot of construction vehicles. You put all that together and it's a real mess. And so I'm just saying we have to correct that. In DC funded ones, often they aren't at 100% when they're put in because the developer takes the risk. They take a risk that they may have to pay operating costs forever if it never makes the risk. The risk is not. And so that's why financially it's not something that is going to impend on our other, our other plans. And I don't, getting the payback isn't my concern as much as the developers. I'm concerned about the safety. And I want it there before we have another school and more buses and things going in there. Another 300 residents waiting 20, 25 minutes even to try to get out and taking their life in their hands every time they do it. And that's what's happening now. Okay, so we're going to go to the um, uh, first speaker is Farrakh Vazile. I probably murdered your name, so please tell, not bad? Oh, good. You have five minutes, sir, to uh, speak. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Farrakh Vazile. Uh, I'm a structural engineer with one of the most uh, reputable consulting firms here in Ottawa, and I hold a PhD in engineering. But today I'm going to talk about uh, this intersection as a concerned citizen. Um, I'm from a country that the streets are no way close to what we see here in Canada, that is very um, lawful. Uh, and I scared to death every time that I'm passing this intersection. I've been driving in Ottawa for the last 12 years, and I can't find any intersection that is any way close to this one. I heard a lot about the talks today, and I understand that the way that um, decisions are made are they in a bigger picture and looking at the policies. But here we are talking about safety of the citizen in a road that people go way more than 100 kilometers an hour, and then you want to come out of a community and turn left into that uh, traffic. Especially in the mornings and in the afternoons, it's, if you want to go through that intersection, you have to wait more than 10 or 15 minutes to get the chance. My wife, for instance, she, she takes the risk and then goes through the community, and sometimes she's stuck behind a school bus that will take her another 20 minutes to get out of the community. So here we're talking about um, one, the safety of the people, and then the 97% warrant that was calculated here in the July of 2017. Um, in the summer times, the schools are not there. Um, the, so th there's a lot less traffic in the community than in the, during the um, school year. Uh, so my might not be a very close representative of what the situation is. Um, the other point that I want to express in that, and it's not very clear in this picture, is that the Huntsville Drive that comes to the Terry Fox, there is two lanes from the Huntsville, so two lanes each way. So there is four lane coming, and the Terry Fox at that point becomes two lane. So the, both cars that are coming into the intersection, one of them wants to turn right, the other one wants to turn left, they obstruct the view. So people cannot even see that the car is coming at a, such a high speed, and then they have to take the chance. They're in the middle of the road to be able to even see that they can go or not. Uh, so I believe that we have a very high 
um, risk situation here at that point, uh, and I appreciate the considerations of the council today. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much for coming out. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, next speaker is um, the actually the uh, the bank, if you will, um, the Richardson uh, Ridge Development folks. Uh, Stephen Cunliffe, uh, uh, Demetrius Yanolopoulos, and David Hook. Are you all coming up, or is just uh, okay? So I think the question for you is going to be, or the statement would be, thank you for offering to front end the money, um, but uh, what if 2022 is not the, the time you get paid back? So I think you should speak. For, uh, whatever you're going to present is fine, but please include that kind of information. Welcome. History to this. So we actually started designing this intersection over three years ago. And it was part of a part of the normal progression of the development. As the houses got up, we knew we had to design the intersection and put it in. We we were going on the basis that Street One and Huntsville was our Street One and Huntsville. And I'll be honest with you, it took us over a year from when we first submitted to the city. This is three years ago to get approval of the design. The design ended up being exactly the approval uh, that uh, the design that IBI had submitted. We then sat down with Moody to enter into a front ending agreement. Again, under the supposition, our street one was street one development charges. Been that way for years. <coughs> well, as we got into it further, we discovered our street one wasn't the street one. It was another one south of Fernbank Road. So it's, it's really just, if, if, I'd had, if I had known that earlier, and if the city hadn't taken a whole year approving a design, I would have made sure, it, I got it in the, the amendments to the DC bylaw. So we wouldn't be here today. Can I just ask you a question? So street one, that you presumed that you were, and you said another one ended up being Street One. Has that one been built? No, it, it, it's it's been built. It's not getting paid back. Uh, the city's reserving funds for the signalization. Is that one in the DC bylaw, uh, Gary? The, the the other one, the, the new Street One. Yeah. So, yes. yes. So, excuse me. The other aspect of this is, since the work, a lot of the works were done as part of Terry Fox Drive, which you know we provided the right of way and we had a whole agreement around Terry Fox. Uh, this isn't a full DC item. I think our full. Uh, uh, budget for this is about 450,000, including soft costs, everything. It's not 650,000. So this is an intersection that can be done for less than most of the others, two thirds of the price. Uh, so we feel very upset about this. The residents were told from the beginning that th the intersection was in uh, was in DCs that we're going to move through. We're going to design it. We're going to build it. They had that expectation. And that's why we're here. We feel very strong about it. The other thing to understand is Huntsville Road is an existing bus route. The other end at Cadet Ave has a signalized intersection, which we, as managing another project, had that put in. So does it make any sense to have a signalized intersection at the other of a bus route and not at actually the Huntsville end or the Terry Fox end where there's even more traffic? The, none of this makes sense. No, what, what, what is at the crux of the matter is that there was an error that was made. So my question is, with the confusion of the street one and the new street one, would there have been two streets that should have been collecting for development charges or was the wrong address 
wrong street put in as the one that was accruing. Does anybody know that? They, don't, they won't know, but do you know it? That's correct, Madam Chair. Both locations should have been in the DC bylaw. Okay. Anybody have any questions for, um, for uh, the, uh, did you have anything else to add, anybody? Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. You can, you can, you can hear, I mean, the, the, the frustration amongst. I just want to add that we, uh, staff are the ones that proposed the 2022 payback. We agreed to it. We need to get on, move on, do this. We have a design. We're quite prepared to get going on that and build it this year in time for school. Uh, it's, we've been working with the councillor now for probably a year and a half, longer. <clears throat> now, what we're being told is, uh, this is Dave Hook to my left, is that he, his expectation is that we will meet Warren this year. All we were short last year was 15 turning movements. Let's face it, in the suburbs from June the 17th, 2017 to today is a whole lot of growth. So I believe you. Um, does anyone have any questions of the, uh, of the delegation? A question of the delegation? Yeah. I think uh, uh, a point I want to make to the delegation is uh, uh, the sense that I get here, and certainly my own, is not frustration with what you're trying to do. It's that we put you in this position w with our processes that we're dealing with. The warrant of opportunity mentioned and, and the, uh, um, the delay in getting this work done and, and what it's creating. So uh, I hope you don't take away from this meeting that we're in any way uh, blaming you for this process. We want to find out what's going on here. Like you said, a year delay on uh, design. How did it not make the DC bylaw? But we have to look at the city wide because it's not just happening here, it's happening everywhere. So okay. that's what we're trying to get at. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Uh, next uh, speaker, I think it's our last speaker, is uh, Jenna Sets. Jenna? Welcome, you have five minutes. Terrific, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to me, what I'm hearing today is uh, really two key issues. So the first being uh, an omission or an error that was made uh, in terms of in the city uh, to exclude or not include uh, this particular intersection in the DC bylaw list. And I need to see our community uh, pay the price for that. The second issue that I can't uh, understate is the safety issue. And so when we look at this map and we see uh, one school that is uh, full and at capacity and a second school that's about to open in September, uh, this is a huge area of growth within Canada North. Um, something that hasn't been mentioned is just beyond, uh, further up that street is the Technology Park. I just moved 1,700 people onto that campus, which has a dramatic increase of traffic that goes up this street. Uh, I travel this road uh, pretty much on a daily basis, at least once, if not twice. So I am witness to what is happening from a, from a safety perspective as cars, uh, be it buses, construction traffic, be it school buses or families that are trying to make this turn and taking their life into their hands as they do. Um, I have been out uh, canvassing in this area, uh, in other areas as well, but particularly in this neighborhood and speaking with um, the great work actually that the Canada Lakes Community Associ Association has been doing uh, and there's, there's, this has really reached a boiling point within this community. People, as it's been said, expected that this traffic was going to be there when they made the decision to live in this community, and now their safety is at jeopardy. That's all. Thank you, Jenna. Anyone have Thank any you. questions for Jenna? 
Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Okay, so we'll come back to uh, the item. Does anyone uh, have anything else to say or are we prepared to uh, vote on this item? Uh, um, Councillor Shirelli? Yeah, I just uh, want to observe that um, the lists are things that we are responsible for. Okay, it's not something staff's responsible for. And uh, we are supposed to take these things actually on a case-by-case -case basis, but we delegate using criteria to come up with a list. But in the end, we are responsible for that list. And so I think if you look at this and you see the amount of time we're spending on this um, sort of exemption to the list or amendment to the list, and it's a very reasonable one, uh, and compare it to the amount of time spent on the list itself when it comes out. Uh, I think you'll, you should be able to understand that uh, paying attention to this kind of thing is the fulfillment of our responsibility here. Because the risk issue is there, especially related to school kids. The financial issue is pretty much taken care of. And um, how are we going to feel or how are we going to even look if we say no to this? and something tragic happens. Uh, people will hold us responsible, and they should, because it is our responsibility. As are all the other ones across the city. This is the one that's before us today. Yeah, well, well failure thank you. to deal thank with you. the other ones is not an excuse for not dealing with this one. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else have anything to say? All right. So on the, um, Wilkinson report on the uh, recommendation the council uh, approved that the city staff be directed to bring forward an to the development charge background study at the earliest possible date to include a traffic signal for the intersection of Terry Fox Drive at Huntsville and that the report address the necessary steps to approve a front ending agreement as soon as possible to the signals so the signals can be installed this year which the um, applicant is prepared to do. Do you want yeas and nays or you just or yeas and nays? Okay, thank you. So, um, Councillor Blake, pardon? What do you say? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Bro uh, 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 Councillor Brockington? Yes. Councillor Shirelli? Yes. Councillor Cluche? Yes. Councillor Hubley? Yes. Councillor Leeper? Yes. Councillor Lisplum? Yes. Councillor Cadre? Yes. Vice Chair Tierney? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So, is Mr. Willis still here? Okay. So I would, the, the, the two meetings, the last one and this one, have been spending a lot of time on safety from a transportation perspective. So I would ask that uh, as quickly as possible you start the DC process, so at least we're managing that. And I think that if you were to pull together um, the uh, appropriate uh, chairs of the various committees and have a discussion with Keith, Ag with Councillor Agwai, uh, Chair uh, Blay of uh, Transit, uh, certainly myself and Vice Chair, uh, I think that there would be value in that. Because I don't, I mean, every meeting that we had, like two meetings in a row to, to have discussions on two very different lists, uh, obviously there's a connection to transportation that we have to be talking about. Okay, thank you. The, uh, oh yeah, we have the additional item. We have the additional item, don't go anywhere. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Sorry, I'll be uh, very brief, Madam Chair. Therefore, it be resolved that planning recommend the council approve the following. That document four of the report be amended as follows. One, principle three, be amended, replacing the last sentence. Furthermore, consequences to enter will be required from the city with furthermore, oh, sorry, furthermore consent. Uh, with uh, furthermore consent to enter, uh, we will be required from the city to for the construction of the connection of the existing pond lakes currently owned by the city to do the deletion of principle nine entirely. Be it further resolved that planning committee requests council suspend the notice required under subsection 29.3 and 34.1 of the procedural bylaw to consider this report at the meeting of April 11th, 2018.
Can we just have staff comment on it, please? Because it's as clear as mud. Yeah. And why is it here? Who knows? Yeah, we don't know the development. Yeah. We don't know. We, we okay. know the Ma problem. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Mark? If I may. Yes, please. Uh, so, Madam Chair, the, uh, the, the report was written on the basis that the land would be in the city's Councilor hands. Councillor Wilkinson, can you please take your conversation outside? Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Mark. Madam Chair, the front end report was written on the basis that the land would be in the city's hands before the work commenced. Uh, and, and staff, having further examined this uh, more, uh, that's not going to be possible. Uh, there are some investigations that need to be done as part of a real estate transaction. Uh, that will mean that the land will be coming to the city's hands later. So this is to permit the work to commence while the real estate, uh, real estate side uh, is being handled, Madam Chair. Okay, so just so for all of you, which he didn't say, but we all want to know, uh, report stormwater management ponds one and two, Leitrim Road storm drainage system, north-south swale and oversized trunk storm sewers in the Leitrim community. Previously, we approved it on February 14th. The motion, um, as he already read it, changes to document four of, of that, of that front-ending principles, Urbandale Construction, oh, sorry, at Corporation, and Claridge Homes, Bank Street, Pond One Expansion, and ex expediting it to council tomorrow. So do you remember that, that front-ending agreement? It took like three years to get it here because it, it, it was a big one, but I know it did take a long, long time. It was engineer and it was on the uh, stormwater. Yes, uh, Councillor Fluche. So, Madam Chair, it's going to Council tomorrow. That's part okay. of it. So, is it right? Uh, and is, is this a technical amendment? We are substituting a document for another document? Yes. Okay. Does it substantially change the report? No, it just means the land will be conveyed to the city. Thank you. We still get it for a dollar, Madam Chair. John, do you have anything to say on this that might be helpful? Yeah, just that, uh, yeah, as Mr. Mark has indicated, the land will be transferred. Um, if we let it go through the process as currently defined, we'd miss the 2018 construction season and it would result in a whole bunch of other delays. Okay. All right. Is that uh, carried? And we'll see it at council tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, any other business? Notice is a motion for the next meeting, which is April 24th. None? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you.